Valentine's Day from God. And we'll be talking about flowers. And we're going to be looking at some scriptures. Just think of all the beautiful flowers. And uh, Job talks a little bit about that, how it says in chapter 1, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. We know that, don't we? He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He seeth also as a shadow, fleeth as a shadow, and continueth not. So beautiful flowers, guess what? They don't last long when the knife goes through the stem and they're cut. But how beautiful. And just to think that God designed every flower of the, gra- of the grass and the field and the herbs. I used to, one thing I used to love, I've never found it in Michigan. I'm sure it's here someplace. But I used to, there, was, there are, in West Virginia, there are lots of meadows running by creeks. You go through the meadow to smell that fresh mint meadow. I haven't smelled that for a long time. But it's beautiful to see all of the little wild flowers that that flow through the meadow and all the flowers that God grows wild on the side of the road. Uh, They can be breathtaking. And the Bible has a lot to say about flowers. And here in Job chapter 14, we're warned that our life is like a beautiful flower that comes forth and then we're cut down. And you know what? Uh, uh, A flower is the most beautiful at the end of its life. Have you noticed that? You know, have you noticed the leaves on the tree don't get their beauty till they're dead and ready to fall off? And sometimes we, when we get older, life is beautiful when you're old. So don't, e- don't ever be ashamed of being old. It's the best of the alternatives. Okay? We enjoy life while God lets us enjoy life. So for scripture tonight, uh, I want us to go in the word of God to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Isaiah, chapter 40. And we're going to read the first eight verses. Listen the way God starts this. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? And this is the response. All flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. And the grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand Forever. Isn't that beautiful? All the things that are temporary, 
And there's some really beautiful things in life that are temporary. And I'd have to, I would have to list, list the flowers, uh, all the beautiful flowers, right up on the top row, the things that's beautiful that just fade away quickly. I remember when Judy and I had anniversaries for every year we were married, I would get a rose. I couldn't afford it when we got up to 65 because <laughs> the prices had tripled for each rose. <laughs> and I learned something. All the beautiful fresh roses, as beautiful as they were, all surrounded by baby breath and greenery, they're so beautiful. But you even put rose petal in there and, and, and like the feed, rose feed. And they last a couple of days longer, but they all begin to wither and dry up. Okay? Finally, I learned a good lesson. If I want my roses to stand, I got fake ones that look beautiful. If you ever need a good rose, crochet, or whatever you call them, I have them, almost in every color, and they're, and they're beautiful. And they're still there, and they look, still look beautiful. But flowers are, are, are really something. And I thought today, you know, about... How many times we wait till someone's gone to send our flowers? They're laying in a casket somewhere in a funeral home, and you finally get around to sending flowers. When? I just think tonight we ought to learn something, and that one thing that we need to learn is this. Give out your roses while they live. Give out your flowers while you live. I'm going to be sharing some things tonight from one of my stories on some flowers that I'm sure will be a, a blessing to your heart, at least. But God wants us to look at this scripture for a moment and just look at some things. How does God start chapter 40? Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Isn't that something that God's telling us to comfort one another? Now, this was written, of course, to, the, uh, to, the, to Israel. But I've said so many times what God said to Israel, he says to us. What commands he gives to them, they still stand to us. We need to comfort one another every way we can. There's so much heartache and sorrow and heartaches, and you come time like today, like Valentine's Day, and I had a wonderful day with Judy today, and on the middle of our table is some beautiful red roses with baby breath. And no, they are not real. But you'd have to get right against them and smell them to make to say to be able to say not. She had a doctor appointment today, and we went there, and she got good reports. Went out and had a nice lunch, and now I get to come to the house of God tonight. And Pastor Dave texted me while we were out shopping. Oh, by the way, I got some new shoes. They're running shoes. And they got springs in there to take the pressure off of my spine so I can walk a little bit better with the, with the shoes. We've had a good day today, a, a good day today. And it just is icing on the cake to get to come to share some things with you tonight in the house of God. So I want to bring a very special happy 
Happy Valentine's Day or Sweetheart's Day, if that's what you call it, from God because he loves us. And he said the very first thing in this scripture, he wants you comforted. Comfort my people. You know why? Because God wants us to be happy. God wants us to be comfortable, and we'll only be comfortable as a Christian and a believer if we're doing his will. There is no comfort outside of God's will. And so we get to be together on Valentine's Day. And God's bring, going to bring us some things tonight from the Word of God to give us some comfort. And uh, that's up to the preachers that's going to be preaching it and the people that's going to be spreading the Word is to be an encouragement and not a discouragement. We need to do that. And be count God's people precious. If they're precious to God, they ought to be precious to us. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her. The first thing God knows is there's a lot of countries torn with warfare. We're compassed about with it that we learned recently in our messages that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. See, that's important. Not only that you, you're winning the battles, but that you're sin-free. How wonderful is it to be sin-free? Your iniquity pardoned. And then God reminds us that there's a penalty for all of this all, all of this iniquity because she's received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So people think we can sin and get by with it, but there is no sinning and getting by with it. Because right. there's, a, there's a payday. And the wages of sin is death. Now, this is the voice of him that was crying in the wilderness. That kind of reminded me of, of uh, the Apostle John to prepare the way of the Lord. The voice that was crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now, I have a message on my heart that will probably become uh, be coming Sunday, but we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to meet God, and uh, over in the book of Joel, when he says, prepare to meet thy God, it's not he's given them time. He said, because I will do this unto you, you prepare to meet God. It's not giving you a chance to repent. Judgment time is there at hand in the book of Joel, Okay multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And you and I are in the valley of decision right now. We're living right on the brink of the coming of the Lord. And we need to be prepared to face God. And I think that's important because people prepare, uh, the, you know, for the funerals sometimes in advance and prepare for insurance in case something happens. And eventually, if time goes on, something will happen. And Prepare for this and prepare for that, but we need to be begin to prepare for eternity with the coming of Christ. When he comes, it's going to be, we are going to be unaware. And God help us not to be unprepared when Jesus comes. If we knew he would come before this before Sunday meeting, I think we'd all be searching our hearts and be saying, I want to make sure that the coast is clear when I stand before the Lord because it's a, it's a fearful thing to stand in front of the living God. And one day we're all going to do that. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. 
every valley shall be exalted. In other words, when you when you're going through life and there and there and there's a and there's a valley, you go you know if you sink down in the valley, the song says, In the valley he restores my soul. Down in the valley is where we forget we lose the the deeper we get into the valley, the farther away God seems. But then when he picks us up and he carries us through. But God said to the child of God that's going, and that valley is going down, and you're going down with it. Every valley shall be exalted. He's going to raise it up as you are. He can keep you out of the valley. He can keep you out of despair and danger. And every mountain and every hill shall be made low. How can I have the strength to climb this mountain that's in my life? You know what? Because God can take a mountain and he can level it. And you can walk it. And the crooked places. How many people are going astray walking the crooked places? He can straighten them out. And the rough places, the things that's going to cause you to stumble. You know what, God? Just like a master craftsman, Woodworker to take that big plane and there's big knots on the logs. A man, when he runs that big plane over, it's smooth. God can make the rough places in your life smooth. He can plane them out. God wants the very best for us. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed because God shows his hand. You see, when you walk with God and you lean upon him and you trust him and you always have your eyes set on him and he is always with you, you know he's with you. How many times in life that, that crisis or things will pop up and, and you'll not be aware that Christ is there? He's there all the time. He sees it all. The glory of the Lord can be revealed. And I like this, that all flesh shall see it. Do you know why? And here's the reason. Because the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. When he is given these kind of instructions, I think this is a pretty good Valentine's Day gift. Right? Wouldn't that be nice if all of your valleys were exalted and all of your mountains were leveled and all your crooked spaces were made straight and everything goes smooth for a change? There'd never be a time where you didn't know what to do or where to go or how to, how to function or how to turn when we got all kinds of surprises in life. Financial surprises, medical surprises, sicknesses, discouragements. Well, there's a lot that God marches us through every day. And we just trudge along and thank him for the, for the little things that he does to heal us. Amen? Because you could trust him. He knows you have what you have need before you ever ask him. In verse 6, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? Listen to this. All flesh is grass. What does he say about the grass? The flower fadeth and the grass withereth. And the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. What happens to the flowers? Their life is very brief for a very short period of time. And that's a picture of our life. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, 
But what is always going to be there for you? Don't miss this. But the word of our God shall stand forever. It will never fail. It will never disappoint. It will never let you down. You can depend upon the word of God all the way. I just think that this is a this is a great gift from the Lord tonight from from this chapter. And we're going to go just a little bit farther. Uh, let's go over to see what God says about our life in James. I love James because it's how to live this life, for us to know how to live this life and all the ramifications of it. Almost all the questions you could have about how to live your life or what not to do in your life or what to do in your life, you can find it in James. It's full of information and wealth. And I want us to go to chapter 4. Well, there's a lot of it I'd like to park on tonight, but we'll just go to chapter 4, verse 13, to start. This is familiar, but we need to think about it and analyze it. Go to now. I want to stop right there, because most of the people go to their past, or they go to the planning of their future, and very seldom they ever go to now. What do you mean, God? Go to now. Go right now, because this is an opportunity right now that God wants to speak to you about your life. Now, what did he want to talk about? Your past? No way. Forget those things that are behind. Press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. So he wants your life to go on. But go to now, ye that say, and boy, here, this is what a lot of people, this is what the majority of people, I believe, if we were to tabulate the result of this, today, or they say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. People make their plan without even, without even talking to the Lord about it. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. We can't say we're going to do anything. And God tells us how to deal with that in just a moment. He said, whereas you know not what shall be on, mor on the morrow. For what is your life? Well, first of all, you don't even know if there's going to be a morrow. Amen? There may not be. But you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? I'll just remind you that it's like those flowers of the field. It's like the grass that withers. It's like the steam that comes out of a steam kettle. And once it comes out, it's gone. It disappears. It's a vapor. It is even a vapor. Think of that. A vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And I've said before, we have only have one life, and we have to live it, and we need to live it by the Son of God and by the Word of God. For that ye ought to say, now God's given us some instruction. If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. You should always include Lord willing. Otherwise, you're making your braggadocious statements and you're by bypassing anything God would even want. We have to tune in to God with our love. And we need to include his will in everything in our life. And if we do things without including God's will, you'll never have a pleasant ending. But now you rejoice in your boastings. Now you think you're going to live forever? 
Guess what? Hate to burst your bubble on Valentine's Day, but you're not going to make it forever in the flesh. You'll make it forever in eternity. Because one day you're going to be moving on. But now you rejoice in your boastings. Look what God said. All such rejoicing is evil. When you say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that without considering God's will, you are doing evil because you're telling God how it's going to be and what you're going to do, and you're leaving him out. It doesn't pay to leave the God out of any decision in your life. And then that's why this verse 17 is so important. And some people don't really grab hold of this, but I think it's important to grab hold of it. Therefore, because you ought to say if the Lord will or if, the, or if, the, or if he will, I will do this or that. Therefore, unto him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Because when we begin to say what we're going to do, we're also saying what we're not going to do. And guess what? We do things we oughtn't to do, and we don't do a lot of things we ought to do. And both is just as sinful and evil against God. The sin of omission as well as the sin of commission of committing things against the commandments of God. This being Valentine's Day, this story from my book came up, and I simply just want to, it's short. I just want to read it. In the book of the Song of Solomon, the Bible says a lot about flowers Jesus is referred to as the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valley. Although there are millions of species of beautiful flowers created by the Master's hand, the Rose and the Lily stand tall above the rest. Matthew 6, 26 and Luke 12, 27 describes the extravagant beauty of the Lily to exceed Solomon and all his glory. But nothing on earth can compare to the beauty and fragrance of a rose. One of the most loved and requested songs the Dobbs family sings is Consider the Lilies. As my mind goes back to the original Dobbs family quartet, I remember that my mother's favorite song was Just One Rose Will Do. She was requested to sing that song virtually everywhere we went. Why does it take occasions such as weddings, birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, Mother's Day, Easter, Christmas, Sweetest Day, or especially funerals, in order for us to give flowers to those we love. The story you're about to read will remind you to give them flowers while they live. In the early 1970s, the pastor of our church decided to go on vacation. Since I had been ordained out of that church and was serving as his right-hand man, he assigned me to look after the functions of the church and handle any emergencies. One day I received a call from the funeral director in the area. He informed me that a lady named Lois, who had attended our church a few years ago, had passed away. The family was requesting that we take care of the funeral service. In the absence of our pastor, I agreed to do so and asked for directions to the funeral home as well as the visitation time for the family. 
When I arrived at the funeral home for the family portion of the visit, I met the family for the first time. They were wonderful people, brokenhearted, and suffering the tragic, sudden loss of their loved one. After settling down a little bit, I decided to get some information about what had happened to Lois and how she died. Lois was 40 years old and the owner of a floral shop. She, she seemed in perfect health and showed no signs of illness. One particular day, she worked late. When the family called about her, she said, I will be home as soon as I finish this floral arrangement. She arrived home about 10.30 p.m., ate a bite, and sat down in a reclining chair to watch the 11 o'clock news. All of a sudden, she began to gurgle, slumped in her chair, and died. There was no prior warning. After hearing this devastating account of what happened, I walked up beside Lois's husband to view the body. She was dressed in light orchid dress and looked young and beautiful. However, the first thing I noticed was the magnificent spray of roses draped over the cask. There must have been eight to ten dozen long stem crimson red roses in the most beautiful floral arrangement of roses I have ever seen. As the fragrance and beauty oh, almost took my breath away, I could not help but comment about them to her husband. I said, that is the most beautiful arrangement of roses I have ever seen. He replied, and little did she know, as she worked late in the shop to finish them, the night she died, as she was making them for her own casket. Life is brief, and loved ones are precious. Let us give them roses while they live. And you've heard me say this a dozen times. Dead noses smell no roses. Let's give our flowers while they can be appreciated. God bless you, Pastor Dave.